So we're told that you can lie down in a, in a field at night, midnight, and see satellites going past. Yeah? Um, funny, on this, in this video, uh, the person capturing these, these so-called satellites says that they don't appear on tracking, on satellite tracking software. So don't know what these things are. But we're told they're satellites. Okay? Now, bear in mind that, uh, again, the size of that satellite is the size of a car, or in this case, let's call it the size of a jet engine, yeah? Now, I know this is kind of um, zoomed in a bit, but when you look at a, a plane flying at 35,000 feet, seven miles, yeah, can you see the engine? Yeah, the plane itself is like a dot. I'm going to start ask again, can you see the engine? Yes, Dave. No, Dave. No. <laughs> is it that early in the morning? Bloody hell. <laughs> the point is, you, you cannot see something that size, even at seven miles. Yeah? And bearing in mind, there's supposedly thousands of these satellites in um, a band which they called low Earth orbit. So you can see where it's thickest around there. Yeah, it's between 100 miles and 1,200 miles, okay? That's where most of these satellites are. Right, so, if you are, this, this drawing is actually to scale, okay? So, one pixel is 10 miles, okay? So, this is the, uh, this is the nighttime side of the Earth, yeah? This is sitting there under where I've, I've shown the ISS, that would be midnight for you, yeah? The sun is on the other side of the planet, okay? So that half of the planet is in darkness, okay? The ISS is 250 miles up, okay? And that's, that corresponds to this lower ring, okay? The, um, the extent of low Earth orbit is 1,200 miles, so you can see that uh, outer ring. But notice something? Most of that, uh, that orbit on that side of the Earth is in shadow. Satellites do not have lights on them. Yeah? So where do they get the light to reflect back? It's in the shadow. And, and I'm saying it's like this is low Earth orbit. So some people say, well, yeah, they're, they're much higher. Yeah? And we're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of miles. How can you see something the size of a car <laughs> with no lights on it <laughs> at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. It's impossible. So, um, you know, <laughs> there's no way. You, can, you can't, cannot argue for satellites. And I'm just going to add this, this, uh, this little bit of video about satellite deployment um, from the STS, one, one of the space shuttle. Um, we are that is just a, a quick scenes of life in orbit. See if you can spot something. Picture, nighttime TV picture of the deploy looks uh, uh, more or less like uh, in the day. You just can't Anybody see it? See it? <laughs> um, we are, that is just a, a quick scenes of life in orbit. Our first antenna deployed Polsat. Uh, it was a nighttime deploy, and so this is a TV picture, nighttime TV picture of the deploy. looks uh, uh, more or less like uh, in the day. You just can't Anybody see it? Anybody see it? We are, that is just a, a quick scenes of life in orbit. Our first task of work was to, to deploy Telsat. Uh, it was a nighttime deploy, and so this is a TV picture, nighttime TV picture of the deploy. looks. Uh, uh, so it's miniatures. They're using miniatures. And did you notice he was saying it's a nighttime deploy? They're in space. It's night all the time. You know what? <laughs> so yeah, um, satellites debunked. So um, moving on to gyroscopes. Yeah. Um, now, I want to claim this one from, from myself, yeah, this idea of the, the artificial horizon. Yeah? I, while I was on that flight to, um, to Macedonia, uh, I, was coming, I was trying to come up with you know, ideas to talk to him about. And uh, I was thinking about the moon, how if it's rotating slowly as it goes, goes around the Earth, how can it kind of rotate, you know, it kind of rolls as it goes across the sky? Yeah? I thought, well, there's a gyroscopic effect. If it's moving around that way, it can't roll that way. But I thought, well, no, that's a bit too, 
bit too silly and I can't really prove that very well. So I, I had the idea about gyroscopes and I was in, on a plane, so I thought, oh, there's an artificial horizon. Why doesn't that? So that, I'm, I'm claiming that one, yeah? I'm that's my one, all right? Sorry. So this is the idea that uh, um, in an aircraft, there's an artificial horizon based on a gyroscope, right? And the thing about a gyroscope is got, uh, and I'm, we're going to do some kind of workshop about this, but um, it's got this property called rigidity in space. When you set a gyroscope spinning, it will stay in its orientation regardless of anything. It doesn't matter about gravity or, or where the Earth is. You know, it stays, if you spin it up at 45 degrees, it will stay at 45 degrees no matter what you do with it, yeah? So when they start up, and um, before they take off in a plane, they will spin up the artificial horizon, okay? And reference it level to the ground. And as the plane takes off, okay, I, know I usually use, need two hands, but... Um, so if that's the plane, and this is the, uh, the gyroscope, takes off, it stays level. The plane takes off and moves around, the gyroscope stays level. Okay? So as it supposedly goes over the curve of the Earth, yeah, the, um, the, the artificial horizon should start rolling backwards. But it never does. It stays completely level throughout the entire flight. So you can see there, that's what, it, that's what should happen. But it doesn't. It tells you that we're floating, we're flying over a plane rather than a, a curved service. And I've, I've actually just uh, skipped ahead anyway, but, uh, but that's what I'm, I'm basically saying. Rigidity, rigidity in space. But the uh, gyroscope also has a, a second property, very interesting property, called precession. So most people think of precession as, um, as it's the wobble in the, uh, in the gyroscope. But it actually isn't. Um, that's just an effect of precession. Um, sorry. So literally what it is, is when you have a spinning gyroscope, if you apply a, uh, um, a force to that gyroscope, the effect of that force is shown 90 degrees away from it. Okay. So in this case, with this uh, gyroscope tipped over like that, the force is downwards for so-called gravity. Yeah. But the effect is 90 degrees away from it, which is that way. So the gyroscope would start to spin around because of the force of gravity pulling it down that way. I know, I know I'm not <laughs> using gravity, but the, f the effect of that force downwards is, is creating a force that way. So it starts spinning around, yeah? So that makes a mockery of one of the explanations given for this, uh, this effect is that the gyroscope has these little veins, these little um, uh, little doors on the bottom of the uh, bottom of the gyroscope that um, compressed air is, is is sort of fired into this thing, and uh, there's these little gates. So when gravity, when the thing tips over, the gates kind of come open and let air out and then right it, <coughs> right? But it doesn't account for this this precession. If the, the force was applied there, right, then it, it's a very difficult concept to, to get across, but um, it would have to know exactly where to, to, to apply the force to, to get the gyroscope to move in the right direction. But the force is always downwards. So it just, it just wouldn't work. It would make the um, artificial horizon unworkable as, as a reference to the ground. So. The other thing about that, though, is it also works if the, if the plane is upside down. So if it's a mechanical gates moving according to gravity, then that, it shouldn't work when the plane is flying upside down. But it still does. So, so essentially, this, is, this right here is absolute proof. So all the proof you ever need that we're on a plane and not flying over a, a, a curved surface. So I'm going to say that this is also debunked. I'm going to talk about NASA now. There's so much we can talk about NASA about, all right, but uh, I'm just going to choose one silly thing, yeah? So I'm going to talk about NASA. Um, the, the one silly thing is, is this guy. I can go to the moon in a nanosecond. The problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology. 
Now, this is an official spokesman for NASA, yeah? This isn't just some guy going, oh, yeah, this is what I think. Now, this is, this is an astronaut. This is an official spokesman for NASA, yeah? So let's look at what this technology that, you know, that they might be lacking here, okay? Well, this is the, uh, this is the Apollo guidance computer, yeah? It's like a 64K of memory, yeah? An 8-bit processor, yeah? And uh, what, uh, 0 0.0.043 0 megahertz? <laughs> okay, well, look, an iPhone is like 32,000 times more memory, yeah? Um, 32 times more the processing power, yeah? And 218,000 times quicker. Now, the lowest on that is a Nintendo Game Boy. And the specs are kind of similar, except uh, you know, the guidance computer has eight times more memory. So slap a RAM pack on a, a Game Boy, and you've got, you've got a guidance computer. <laughs> well, what's the problem, you know? <laughs> right, so, I mean, do they have the, uh, the power, the uh, ability you know, to actually go to the moon? Well, when you compare the space shuttle to the uh, Saturn V, well, you know, it's, um, the Saturn V actually got up into uh, a 93-mile orbit, okay, before it took off for the moon, okay? So the third stage was able to, to um, go from 93 miles up to the moon, yeah? Um, and it, I think it, it burned for six minutes. It was able to burn for six minutes. Well, the space shuttle, with its, uh, with its tank, can actually burn for eight and a half minutes, and go from um, go up to 17,000 miles a, a, an hour. Okay, so one mission to take a, an external tank up into space, another mission to take a, a, a shuttle to go and dock with it, and now you've got a spacecraft that can go all the way to the moon and back. Okay, and have a lunar lander inside the payload bay. Yeah, There's, I mean they they're showing us they can do it, but they can't. Do they have the, the technology, to, you know, spacesuit technology? Well, they've been using it, apparently. So what is it? What is it they, the, they're missing here? Perhaps we can't build a, a lunar lander anymore. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've seen these close up, but it's shocking. You know, give me, give me a million dollars, yeah, and I'll build them something, yeah? Something better than this. This is curtain rods, you know? Can you see how... The, the things aren't lining up, the panels aren't lining up, you know? It's, it's, it's stupid. How can, how can our, our parents support this in 1969? This is crazy. So the only thing, the only technology that I think uh, we have difficulty uh, replicating is the uh, one million dollar space pen. I don't know if you know about this, but they, they, they spent a million dollars trying to figure out how to make a pen right in space, in zero gravity. Yeah. The Russians figured it out, they used pencils. <laughs> so I'm going to call NASA debunked. So um, this, this next section, I want to actually um, debu debunk ourselves here. Because there are a few things that we say that uh, we can't really defend. Okay, so this is this is a section about um, a, about debunking ourselves because there's a few times we, we kind of make ourselves look a bit silly. Okay, so the first one I want to look at is the transparent moon. Okay, the idea there is that um, now I'm not saying that the moon isn't transparent. I don't know. I've not been there. Yeah, um, it could well be. But the point I'm trying to make here is that they have a model that works. We don't. So if we try and argue, you know, against their model, we will look s stupid because they'll just give, give out their model and it's a plausible one and we'll just look stupid, okay? So I'm not saying that the moon isn't transparent. I'm saying that we shouldn't be um, using that as a proof, okay? So the idea is that, um, yes, uh, during the day we see the moon, you know, lit up, you know, half of it perhaps, and why don't we see the other half in darkness, why, why isn't it black on the other side, yeah? Well, when you shine a light, um, when you shine a light across your vision, right, you won't see it, okay? Unless the light goes into your, into your retina, you won't see it. 
But if the light is bright enough, right, the actual you know, air molecules will start to reflect that light, and you'll see it. Just like you know, you've got a very powerful torch at night, and you'll see the beam. It's literally the air molecules reflecting that light back to you. So this is what's going on. According to their model, the sunlight is hitting the atmosphere. Sunlight's so bright, it's actually reflecting the, the air molecules around, uh, around there back into your eyes, so you see, you see this you know, blue sky, whatever. Now, if the moon is, is, is out there and it's bright, it's going to be brighter than the air molecules. Oops. Oh, telling me something. Um, so it's going to be oh, brighter than the air molecules. And, um, and so you'll see the lit up part, but you won't see the darkness because the, the air molecules are going to touch. The other thing is clouds behind the sun and moon, okay? Uh, yeah, there's, I've seen some pictures. It, sa it sounds kind of, it looks kind of, uh, you know, intriguing and stuff, but we don't have a model for that, yeah? The, the, the clouds are a, a, a fairly fixed height, and it's way below the, uh, the, the sun and, and the moon, so there's no model for that. But what you, what you do find is if you take uh, that picture and you start putting it in, into Photoshop, right? You start seeing artifacts around the, uh, you know, it's not, so, it's not very clear because the, the sun is so bright that the, what's going on is the sun is so bright that the different densities of cloud, some of them, um, parts of the cloud are just going to be, um, the light's gonna shine through it and you're not, just not gonna see it. But when you put it through Photoshop, you, you see some of that cloud actually appearing um, where it's apparently, is this, you all right? Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, um, so some of the, some of the cloud um, actually shows up. It's not very easy to see with the, with the sun because it's so bright, but it's actually easier to see where, when, when the moon, when it happens with the moon. So here I, I actually take uh, this picture from, of the moon into Photoshop and, uh, you can see that I'll, I'll invert the colors to start with. So it's easier to see. And I'm gonna play around with the levels. So the invisible part of the cloud that uh, you can start see, you see it start to pop out, okay? So it's literally that the cloud um, that looks like it's behind is actually in front but it's, it's so thin that the, uh, the moon or sunlight just shines through and you can't, you can't see it, okay? And the last one, I think the last one, uh, I don't know if anyone's come across this one. Um, this one actually got me for a while. Um, they asked if, uh, if did, did they forget about the tilt, right? The idea behind this one is that the reason the equator is so hot is because the light um, from the sun is hitting the equator at 90 degrees. So it's going to be hottest there. And where the sunlight hits the Earth at an angle, it's not going to be quite so hot. Okay? But we see um, that the band of heat is kind of along the equator. Okay? So the idea is if the, did they forget about the tilt? Because uh, if the Earth's tilted, then right there, the, uh, where, the, where the sun's hitting at 90 degrees isn't the equator, yeah? So that got me for a while, I was thinking, yeah, well, that's a proof there. But then I thought about it and realized that, hang on, that's only looking at one, one angle, one, one particular place in the Earth's orbit, so-called orbit. So for twice in a year, right, that's, that's exactly what's happening. 
yeah? The um, equator is side on to the, uh, to the sun. So yes, it's going to be shining exactly um, 90 degrees, you know, because it's across the side. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, but the rest of the time, when it's, when it's here, it's actually um, the Tropic of Capricorn. When it's over there, it's the Tropic of Cancer. So literally that, that uh, band of heat is kind of like the average between you know, the two tropics. And so and it's a bit above average at the equator because two times the, out of the year, it's going to be directly over the, the equator. So basically, yeah, we've got to stop using things like this. It's really exciting finding a new proof. Yeah, you get really sort of uh, happy and excited. Um, can you give me a, let me finish that. Okay, but you know, the the, the point is that uh, you know we can we can look at things and we can think of them as as proofs because we get really excited when we find something. But you know, you really got to give it some more thought. And make sure that we're not actually we're not actually helping these guys, yeah, because that's that's what we're doing. If we if we don't think things through properly, right, and then rush out and uh, and put these this out um, publicly then we, we end up looking a bit silly, you know, because, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll open ourselves up to, to you know, uh, uh, total criticism because we just, we just look silly, let's put it that way. So let's not help these actors, right, um, to fight us. So that's all I want to say. I'm sorry to, uh, you know, <laughs> go, go a bit sort of uh, crazy, but that's, that's all I want to say. Thanks a lot. What? Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so your example of the uh, your example of the plane. Mm -hmm. Why is it that if I'm on a jet and I jump, why don't I slam into the back of the plane? Well, that's that's inertia. It's, it's the same. I'm not. I'm not sort of. I'm not um, uh, talking against inertia. We know that happens, yeah? What I'm talking about, when the plane starts taking off and, and, and moving you know, um, against the spin, yeah? It's overcome, it's inertia, yeah? So, okay, so when the plane is hovering, yeah? It's inertia is, is keeping it spinning backwards, yeah? Even though it's not connected to the Earth, yeah? The fact that it was, was connected to the Earth and then lifts off. It's still moving backwards. That's their model, yeah? All right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I'm saying is, if that plane decides to start moving forward, yeah, it's now overcome that inertia. The inertia doesn't, doesn't take any place in it anymore. Yeah? yeah. You follow now? Yeah? That doesn't necessarily explain why I wouldn't. If you jumped in the air, yeah, you're still... If, if, if we're on a um, moving train and I jumped into the air, yeah, as soon as I jump, I'm, I'm still, I was connected to the, the train, I jump in the air, I'm still moving forward at that speed, yeah? That's, that's, that's the way they, their model works. But if I was to jump into the air and, um, I don't know. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's difficult trying to explain their model and try and make it sound like it works, but yeah. Um, but that's, that's the only, it's, it's inertia. You're moving with the train, right? So you jump in the air, you're still moving. If you were to jump in the air and hang there for, for like a few seconds or 10 seconds, you would start to lose inertia and, uh, and you'd start moving that way, <laughs> yeah? Just like when you, you throw, a, you, you throw a, a pebble outside of the train, yeah? It will actually start to, to, to slow down. Yeah, it, will, it, won't go, it won't carry on at the same speed as a train. It will start slowing down because of friction and stuff. So, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm arguing their model, so.
Ja, ähm, ja. I, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not one of these people who will, um, you know, wildly speculate. You know, I, no. I have no idea. I've not been there. You know, I'm, I can only go with the information I get. And this information is conflicting. Now, I've seen pictures of, um, of what look like stars appearing through the moon. But I, I don't have a model for that. I don't know. So I'm not, mm. I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, I'm... That, um, um, that might be unpopular to I people, but I, I do not speculate on stuff because I don't have enough information. So I, I'm, I can't speak intelligently about it. Uh, e even the Bible, uh, because we are uh, represent the uh, pure gospel on the flat earth, for us it is nothing news that it is a flat earth because it is nothing news. Yeah. Yeah. But it is interesting uh, about this moon for me. From uh, that, uh, for sure, that Neil Armstrong, 1969, I'm from 1961, that we should believe he was on the moon. And in our uh, region, in our um, north of Netherlands, there was one guy, Klaas Dijkstra, mm -hmm. he already wrote two books of the nonsense that, it, that uh, this Apollo flights right. should be uh, done. It was amazing. In 1966, 67, 8, he wrote books about that. Mm -hmm. But nobody take him serious, of course, in that uh, time. Uh, I can give to my colleague too. Sure, he sure. has a good question for you too. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, Dave, uh, I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, yeah. Um, so professional and um, undebunkable, uh, I would say. Like you're standing way uh, uh, higher than uh, the people from NASA and, uh, and the and the globe earthers who present who uh, should present uh, real science uh, stuff, but uh, so I, re I really appreciate it, man. Um, and uh, I, I had this question about uh, this uh, boat vanishing uh, 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 around uh, uh, in, in the horizon, basically. Uh, yeah, to me that's uh, quite, quite a, an amazing uh, phenomenon, how that, uh, that happened. So um, I, I saw also this video on uh, uh, how boats uh, vanish in the horizon, something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, I was wondering, could you might maybe uh, uh, extend that uh, that idea a bit more further? So when it completely vanishes in the horizon, or uh, yeah, what 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 exactly happens at, at that at that moment? Right. Well, again, we. We're still kind of struggling with this. We're we're trying to we're we're trying to take the place of these uh, these scientists. Yeah, they're not telling us these things, and we are actually going out ourselves and f and figuring this stuff out. Okay, um, I mentioned about the uh, the laser experiment in Lake Balaton, um, where uh, the laser went across the, the lake flat um, on the surface and then suddenly shot upwards. Okay. Got, we've got pictures of it, you know, bending upwards, really weird. Couldn't figure out why that is until somebody showed me a video of um, somebody firing a, a laser through a tank, a, a fish tank of water, yeah? And they started adding sugar to the water. 
And when they got to, when they, the water got to a certain saturation level, the laser beam bent downwards. So the only thing, you know, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not the expert on this. The only thing I can think of is that you get to a certain saturation point in the air, so you, the light is going through so much atmosphere, it gets to a certain saturation point, and then the light is, is bent so suddenly. Okay, it gets to a, like a threshold, and suddenly it's bent. And I think you always tend to get this, this thin band of atmosphere that just flips upside down, whatever's above it, and, uh, and hides what's really going on, which is the real horizon um, and the bottom of the boat. Okay, so, so, so that's it. I, d I don't know. Right? We're, still, we're still trying to figure it out. You know what? We should, some of us should be getting Nobel Prizes for what we're finding out, you know? <laughs> but obviously they're not going to give us Nobel Prizes, you know? We're, 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 we're actually finding stuff out that, that the that science isn't telling us. Yeah, so, so yeah, I don't know, but you know, eventually somebody ha will, will put together you know, the definitive work on the Fata Morgana. Um, f phenomenon. So, anyone else? Um, yep. I mentioned the gyroscope uh, proof to somebody. I mentioned the uh, gyroscope, gyroscope proof to somebody, and um, they said, well, that's not how gyroscopes work. The gyroscope is actually pointing to the centre of the <laughs> Earth. Right. That's, that's, that's quite funny. Um, one really interesting thing. When I, was, when I was actually researching the, uh, the gyroscope, um, I found this MIT professor, Walter Lewin, right, who did a, um, a, these video experiments um, for MIT. Right? And on his presentation, he absolutely says that when you spin up a gyroscope, it has no relationship, it's not affected at all by gravity or the Earth. So. I went back to find that video. I didn't, didn't save it, I'd, uh, I went back to find that video. And would you believe, they've changed the video. They've, they've literally cut out the bit where he's talking about the gyroscope and, and they dubbed over with, uh, with another part of his, uh, his presentation. So they're, they're actively going back and hiding this stuff. But what he said, um, and what is true, is rigidity in space means it's not affected by anything. You can spin that gyroscope at 45 degrees. It's not pointing to the, to the Earth anymore, yeah? But it will act in exactly the same way, right? So, so when they say it's pointing this and the Earth is actually pulling it straight, no. If it was doing that, then it wouldn't work as an artificial horizon. Anyone else? Uh, there? D, just D, just give it to the next person and uh, and yeah. The Neil deGrasse Tyson, he in the Aristotle's um, experiment didn't actually s mention that the sun moves for the flat, flat Earth, and so that that wipes it anyway. He doesn't mm. mention that he's he's um, presuming that both in both cases that the sun is stationary. Um, as far as things disappearing, I mean, it's the limitation of your zoom. Once it's out of sight, wouldn't it, if your, limita your zoom's limited, it's going to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the other thing about the, the light of the sun and the moon, um, it's provable that they are two different luminaries, as the Bible says, and mm -hmm. they have a completely different light. So it's not a question of one being a reflection of the sun, even in the daytime. And uh, my sister, and she's in Australia, and I'm here. Mm -hmm. We've been taking photos of the moon, at, and it's exactly the same shape. It, I'll see it bright yellow, she'll see it white. But yeah, there's lots of interesting things. But yeah, yeah. it's definitely a light and not a planet you can land on. Well, <laughs> yes. The, the thing for m about the moon for me is that um, it doesn't act like it's a solid surface. Because, you know, any solid curved surface, you know, acts in a very predictable way. You know, there's always a hot spot. And then as the, the light will drop off as it goes around the curve, yeah? But we see the moon lit up completely uniformly, yeah, as it's as if it's a, a disc, yeah, and and the idea that this disc only ever presents one face also kind of lends weight to this idea that it's a disc, it's not not spherical, 
and then you, you factor in the fact, as you say, that the quality of the light from the, from the moon is completely different from that of the sun. So then it can't be a, ref a, a sphere reflecting the light of the sun because it's producing its own light, and that light is completely different. So yeah, it's, um, there, there's so much. There's so, this is why I cannot become a, a glober anymore. I cannot, there's no way I can go back because there's too much, too much stuff. Yeah? If, if somebody started presenting me um, with real tangible evidence that I've got it wrong, I, I, I'd be the first one to say, look, I got it wrong. And let, I'll take all my videos down and, and I'm gonna shut my, shut my face, you know? But no, it's not gonna happen. So yeah, who's next? Okay. Okay, Dave. Um, I live by the sea, and there's one thing that's got that's me. Nice for you. <laughs> it's great, yeah, when the sun's shining. Um, and there's a wall, which that wall, I take it, is level. And there's one thing that's got me, and I'm just trying to think, am I saying this in my own head, and if you can just confer with me, that um, you can see, like, a curve on the wall. And I'm trying to explain that. And then, yeah, I've, I've done all the research. And the wall is level, and when you get eye level, if you're walking up to it from a distance, say, of 100 metres away, you can definitely see the curve. And so, I'm trying so, sorry, to... Sorry, you're saying that there's a wall that's level... That's the wall that's level... But you can see a but, curve... But you can see the bay, the, the water in behind it, yeah. okay, for the whole of, like, Lime Bay. Now, what I say is, am I right in saying that when you do see a curve... If you've got a range of, like, you can see, say, 30 miles, that if you go around in a circle like that, it's your depth or the length that you're seeing. So if you drew a line like that, say, if you can see as far as your fingertip, mm. round in a radius like that, that is what you're seeing. It's your, 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 your range of view, as it were. I, yeah, I believe it is your, your perception that you... Because I've done it myself. Like when you do that, you know, you, you kind of get this uh, feeling of a curve. But I... Because I, I did that at, uh, at the seaside one day. I was just uh, thinking, you know what? I can sort of see a curve, you know, when I go like that. But what I did was there was a sign in, on Seaford Beach. It's a big sign. And uh, the, the bottom edge is obviously straight. And I literally you know, stood in front of the sign and lined that edge up with the horizon, and it's perfectly flat. So, you know, I, any curvature that I saw was just a perception, because I measured it with the uh, bottom of the sign. So, I think that's the last, last question. Um, but uh, I'll, just, I'll just say, um, I've, got, um, I've got a book out there, and it's, uh, there's a few more copies over there somewhere and it's called the human body owners workshop manual and it's how to heal yourself of anything with nothing and uh, how to operate your body so uh, thanks very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference